mistake, so uh, it is a pleasure to uh, open the uh, third uh, linear lecture uh, uh, supported by the Farnton's uh, family. And it is a special uh, pleasure to introduce uh, again our speaker, uh, Professor uh, Hugo Dumoulin uh, uh, Coquin from the uh, uh, IHS in uh, France. Uh, uh, we already heard about uh, Hugo in the presentation before his uh, uh, lecture on uh, Tuesday and on Wednesday. Uh, so I don't want to repeat too much. Uh, let me just say that uh, he obtained the uh, fundamental uh, contributions uh, in probability, uh, in statistical physics, uh, and uh, he won uh, numerous uh, words. And uh, uh, and if we predict, he will win uh, many more. In addition, uh, he is also a superb speaker, as we saw on Tuesday when he talked about self-reporting walks, and as we saw on uh, Wednesday uh, when he talked about a uh, sharp threshold uh, in population. Uh, you know, usually when you give uh, two lectures in the same place uh, and you see people returning from the first lecture to the second, uh, then you may wonder, you know, uh, maybe it's because they uh, liked your first lecture and they want to hear you again, but it's also possible that they thought your lecture is terrible and they want to give you a second chance. <laughs> <laughs> Say, uh, so, so this is what's good about giving a free lecture. When you see and I see that uh, a lot of you uh, came back, then it's clear that uh, this is because it's the first reason. And indeed, we all uh, enjoyed the lecture on Tuesday uh, and enjoyed the lecture on uh, Wednesday. And I'm sure we all uh, enjoy uh, the lecture today as well. And the uh, topic today is the uh, uh, russo seymour Welsh theory and its application in, dependent, in the study of dependent population. Well, thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> now, now I have this dub, I just don't know whether you are not just very patient people who give me a third chance. So I'm, uh, I will have to come back, I guess, to... Uh, <laughs> Okay, so uh, yeah, today's lecture is, is going to devote it really um, to, to a particular dim dimension. I mean, what I was explaining, for instance, yes, I mean, on Wednesday, uh, with the sharpness uh, results, you could think of percolation in any dimension. Today, it's going to be specific to two dimensions. And maybe to, to have a, a sufficiently large class of percolation models and yet sufficiently small that we don't uh, lose ourselves in a, le Let me recall you like one family of models that I will consider. So I will be on Z2. Let's, uh, I mean, we could take all the planar lattices, but let's take Z2. Um, and the probability, so I don't tell you again what percolation models are, but the probability of... Uh, of a configuration would be depending on uh, two parameters, P and Q. Okay, so I'm not going to just think of Bernoulli percolation. I'm also going to look at more general models. And the probability of a configuration will be P to the number of open edges. So remember that the edges with omega e equal 1. 1 minus P to the number of closed edges. Those our edges with omega e equals zero, so that the edges that are not in our graph, and q to the number of connected components in omega. So this is connected components in omega. And if I want this to be well defined, I need to renormalize, and that's why I'm thinking first of a finite graph, lambda, so a finite part of Z2. In this case, omega has a finite number of open edges, a finite number of closed edges, and a finite number of connected components. So everything makes sense. I just need to renormalize by, by a constant in order to get a probability measure. OK? So that defines a measure on lambda. And then what I can do is I can take lambda to infinity. 
by for instance taking bigger and bigger boxes to define an infinite volume measure which I will denote like that. Okay, and think that there is a notion of a random graph uh, in infinite volume which is defined for every Q. So for people who didn't, I mean, uh, I mean maybe that didn't follow the second lecture or that are a little bit lost, for most of the lecture you can really think of Q equal one because remember that when Q equal one, this is just a way of saying choose edges at random with probability P and uh, remove them with probability one minus P independently for every edge. So when Q equal one, you get this model that I talk about on, on Wednesday, which is Bernoulli percolation. And in fact, most of what I will tell you will be related to that. It's just that the juice of the result exactly lies in the treatment of the Q not equal to one model. So that's why I want to take this more general uh, quantity. Okay. And what is, so what, what do I want to do during this, uh, this lecture? Well, I want to understand if I give, I give you a box, for instance, uh, n by a two n box or a n by a rho n box, I want to understand what is the probability that there is a path of open edges going from left to right. Okay? So, what is this thing? And why is it relevant to understand the behavior of this thing? Okay? And maybe to motivate you, because we are on Friday, so we need a little bit of uh, cheering up. To motivate you, I'm going to try to explain to you how you can compute what is the critical point of your model. Remember, the critical point is the smallest p for which there exists an infinite connected component almost surely. Okay? This is PC. And I want to tell you how one can use this type of quantity, what we call crossing probabilities. How we can use these crossing probabilities to compute this critical point. So motivation is going to be the following theorem. Let's start with the following theorem of Harry Keston, who, who was one of the most influential probabilists of the second half of, uh, of the 20th century. It's a beautiful theorem dating back to uh, 1980 and which is saying PC of uh, Bernoulli percolation is equal to one half. So I want to explain that to you. To give you an idea why this is true. Which is a little bit more evolved than just this is the simplest number between zero and one. Okay? So what is special at one half? What, what does make, uh, I mean, percolation special at one half? Well, let's exactly look at the crossing probability. So let's look at probability at one half of crossing uh, n by n plus one box. What is this crossing probability? Hint, it is a number between zero and one, and it's the simplest number between zero and one. So this probability is going to be equal to exactly one half. And why is this is true? Because if you don't have a crossing, then that means that you have a blocking surface, right? I mean, think of all the vertices connected to the left. And you have a blocking surface of edges that are closed, right? And what I can do is I can just think of it. So imagine I, I, I zoom in my, uh, my graph. And I have the open edges like that. And let's say I am on the boundary. I mean, this guy is not connected to this guy. That means that this edge is closed, but I can also represent it by saying, well, let's write the, I mean, let's draw the dual edge, the edge of the dual lattice crossing this edge. 
and let's draw, let's uh, let's uh, draw this edge and let's do it for every close edge of omega every edge which is not in omega i draw the dual edge instead and when i do that what i end up is that i end up with exactly a path in the dual graph which is crossing from top to bottom this kind of dual rectangle. But the good thing is that this path, these edges, they are all on the dual graph, but the dual of the square lattice is also a square lattice. Right? So what is the distribution of these green edges? Every edge is present in the dual configuration, if you want. In, I mean, I draw it if I didn't draw the original one. So they are present with probability 1 minus p, and they are absent with probability p. Also, the state of the edges is completely independent of the others because it only depends on the state of the corresponding edge of the primal lattice. So this green percolation is nothing but percolation of parameter 1 minus p. But when p is equal to 1 half, it's just percolation of parameter 1 half. So this, if I don't have this, then I have this. Let's draw it like that. I have this crossing. And the sum of these two events must be equal to 1, because this is a complementary event to this one. But here, you notice that the shape n times n plus 1 is exactly made in such a way that the shape of this green of the dual lattice, uh, the dual graph, is exactly the same. It's a rotated version of the thing. So these two things have the same probability. Hence, this is equal to 1 half. So why is this useful? Well, notice first thing. On Wednesday, we actually prove something. We prove that if p is smaller than pc, then in fact the probability that 0 is connected to distance n is decaying exponentially fast. Right? But then, how fast is decaying the probability to have a crossing from left to right in a box? Well, I have, or let's maybe put n minus 1 and n. This would be more elegant. I have n points on the left. They all need to go to, I mean, one of them needs to go to distance n. So the crossing probability, if one half was strict, strictly smaller than pc, then the crossing probability would also decay exponentially fast. Which contradicts the fact that it decays polynomial, I mean, which, I mean, it doesn't decay at all. Okay, so that already just tells you that pc has to be smaller or equal to one half. So you may think, OK, maybe I just proved to you the easy bound. Maybe that's the other bound which is difficult. Well, historically, it's not the case. This was the hard bound. So it's one of the examples of the, the strength of this exponential decay result is that it actually makes this bound basically trivial. Okay? Let me just give you a hint of why the other bound is true. OK? So assume that PC is strictly smaller than 1 half. OK? So in this case, by ergodicity, so you know that there exists an infinite cluster. And by ergodicity, it's easy to see that it, ha it exists with probability 1. So what you can do is that whatever you know you can fix epsilon, think of epsilon as 1 over 10 to the 10 to the 10, whatever, okay, like a tiny, tiny number. And what you can do is you can fix k, you can choose k such that the probability at 1 half of having a pass from the box of size k to infinity is larger or equal to 1 minus epsilon, right? 
This is just measurability. There exists an infinite cluster, so if I take a large enough box, this infinite cluster intersects the box with probability 1 minus epsilon. Okay. So notice that in particular, if I take a box of size n for any n larger or equal to k, I also have that just having a path from the, small, the center of the box to the boundary is larger than 1 minus epsilon. So at this stage, there is a natural question to, to ask him, uh, oneself is, OK, is this a sufficiently strong property to imply that, in fact, the crossing probability is going to tend to 1? Because if I can prove that, then I contradict the fact that PC was strictly smaller than 1 half. OK, so maybe as a first example, can I prove that the probability to go from the box in the middle to really the right side is also close to 1. Let's think of that. So if you do things naively, what you say is, well, this, I mean, the path that is going to infinity or going to the boundary here has to go to one of the edges, right? So the union bound should tell me, well, the probability that it goes to the right edge is at least 1 minus epsilon everything divided by 4. So it's a terrible bound because that doesn't tell me at all that my crossing, I mean, that my probability is close to 1, but, well, that's what you get. Well, it's not really what you get because there is an inequality in percolation which tells you the following. It tells you if you take two events, A and B, which are increasing, meaning that their indicator function is increasing, or if you prefer, meaning that if you have a configuration in A, then any configuration with more open edges is also in A. Typically, existence of a path. Okay? If you take two events A and B which are increasing, then this inequality due to Harris is telling you, well, probability of A knowing B is larger or equal to the probability of A. This is quite intuitive if you think about it because if B is an increasing event, it wants to have open edges. So if B occurs, it's kind of telling you that there are more open edges than it should in your configuration, and these open edges are going to help the occurrence of A. Okay? So it's, it's not a very difficult inequality to prove, but the good thing is that you can try to use this inequality, I mean, you can even succeed normally, to prove that if you take for increasing events, then the, and then the probability, and let's say they all have the same probability, then the probability of one of them, not only it's smaller than uh, 1 minus the probability of none of them occurring. I mean, it's, sorry. You, I mean, you could, you could try to prove this. This will be the union bound if they all have the same probability. But you can actually improve the, this bound by proving the following. If the probability of the union is larger or equal to 1 minus epsilon, then the probability of one of them is larger or equal to 1 minus epsilon to a quarter. And this is a very simple manipulation using this thing. Okay, So probability of union of the AI larger or equal to 1 minus epsilon implies probability of maybe the max of the i of the probability of a i is larger than 1 minus epsilon to a quarter. So this is called the square root trick, and it's a very important trick because it tells you that you can improve the union bound to get actually something which allows you to have a probability close to 1. So here, if I want to go to the right, I can put 1 quarter here. Okay. But this is also telling you that then, if I assume that this is connected to the right, well, the probability that there is a path also to the left, well, it's larger or equal to 1 minus epsilon to a quarter, right? Because these are two increasing events. They therefore are positively correlated. So I can assume this thing. But now I'm almost there. I almost have a crossing from left to right. 
what is missing is just that this path going to the right and this path going to the left, maybe they are not connected to each other. OK? Maybe, in some sense, I'm unlucky and I get a path of dual edges separating them. Okay. But there is a result, which is first due to Eisenman, Kesten Newman, and which was generalized by Burton and Keane, that tells you the following. It's telling you, well, when there is an infinite connected component, it's unique. There is a unique one. But that then tells you that if you let n goes to infinity, the probability of crossing must be larger than 1 minus 2 epsilon to a quarter because the defect, I mean, if it wasn't, that's because there are two infinite connected components that are being bit. Okay, so the uniqueness of the infinite connected component, which I'm not going to prove to you now, but which is maybe believable if you think of like a huge emerging infinite cluster, it's kind of decent to believe it's unique, where the uniqueness, so maybe let me finish here, uniqueness of infinite cluster, where well, that implies that the probability at one half of crossing, so I did n by n, but you could shift, and I mean, really, uh, this is, uh, you could do, I mean, n minus 1 by n, it's, it would not be a difficulty. The probability of crossing is turning to 1, which is contradicting the fact that it's equal to 1 half. Okay? So, to summarize this theorem, one inequality is exponential decay plus the fact that this probability is not tending to 0. And the other inequality is uniqueness of the infinite cluster plus the fact that this is not tending to 1. And you see how much this thing equal 1 half is crucial in the computation. Yes? I, I of course, delighted to see uniqueness used uh, for this argument, but yeah. actually, couldn't you just use the dual bound? No. No, no. The dual bound will not give you the, no, no. It will not give you the inequality in the other direction. No, because you are assuming PC smaller than one half, not PC star smaller than one half, because PC star smaller than one half would give you PC larger than one half. It's, uh, this would be the other inequality. I, I, can, I can explain to you, uh, I guarantee that, uh, that, that this is not working. These are really two independent ingredients. Okay. Okay, but you see, there are things here that are not really dependent on, on, on Bernoulli percolation, if you think about it. Imagine that I would like to compute now. So can I? Oh yeah, I can. Perfect. Maybe like that. If I try to compute the critical point for this model, for the Fortwin Castellan percolation. So PC of Q, and Q will refer, I mean, critical point for the model with uh, Q arbitrary. What is it equal to? Well, what I can try to do is I can try to find here the P for which this quantity is going to be basically equal to one half. OK? But where, where is, I mean, is it one half, for instance, the right quantity? Well. Here, it was really dependent on the fact that the distribution of these green edges were exactly Bernoulli percolation of parameter 1 minus p. When you start with fk percolation, when you start with something like that, and that you look at the distribution of the green edges, in fact, an easy use of Euler formula, so maybe here, let's do the proof. So Euler formula is actually telling you not that it's going to be a fk percolation with parameter 1 minus p. It's telling you, well, if 
omega is indeed like percolation of parameter p and q, then omega star, let's omega star, let's, let's call it, the, let's say it's the green guys, then omega star is like a percolation of parameter p star and q star, where q star is equal to q, that's what was already the case for Bernoulli percolation. But now P star is satisfying something different. It's satisfying the following duality relation that P star is defined by this formula. So you see when Q is equal to 1, P star is exactly 1 minus P. But when Q is not equal to 1, P star is not 1 minus P. It's a certain quantity expressed in terms of P. And now, well, what is the p for which you are going to have that this thing is equal to 1 half? It's going to be exactly the p for which p is equal to p star. Okay? What we could call the self-dual point for this duality relation. And when you look at the self-dual point here, so the point for which you have this equal to, I mean, p equal p star, p star you get square root of q over 1 plus square root q. So it's very decent to conjecture that this is the answer. Then you can basically prove something like that. I'm cheating, but I will tell you more about it later. So you can basically prove that this is equal to 1 half. Excellent. So then the exponential decay that we proved on Wednesday, the result that we proved with Aran Raufi and Vincent Tassion, is going to imply that PC is smaller or equal to square root of q over 1 plus square root q. And in fact, the second part of the argument, we use very little on percolation. The only thing we use is this FKG inequality here. And this FKG inequality has a very nice property to be true for the FK percolation as long as q is larger or equal to 1. So here, Maybe not surprisingly, you get that the result for any q larger or equal to 1. It's actually predicted for q smaller than 1 as well, but there we lose our main tool and nobody knows how to even define the notion of PC in this case. Even the definition of PC is not clear. So this is a result which actually dates back to 2012. So it's before the paper of, uh, with, uh, with Raufi and Tassion, exactly like Kesten's paper result is before the first sharpness, the first exponential decay result of Menshinkov and Eisenman Barsky. The reason is that when you are in two dimension, you actually have arguments that can replace the exponential decay uh, result. So, I'm not giving you the historical approach. I'm giving you the geodesic one because this is only that was the motivation to try to tell you that looking at these crossing probabilities is important. And that one thing that you get is that it seems that the critical point is exactly the place where these crossing probabilities are not really going to zero or not going to one. OK? So that was the motivation. Yes, yes. Except FKG works for, uh, for Q bigger or equal than 1 is simple? Or? It's not very difficult. Yeah, it's, it's less. I mean, for Q equal 1, you do it by uh, just uh, an induction is, uh, yeah, is giving you the thing. For Q larger or equal to 1, what you do is that you use what we call holy criterion. It's, a, it's, a, it's something that uh, it's a criterion that you can easily check that it holds for any q larger or equal to 1. And that after that allows you to define um, a dynamics on this measure, which allows you to, to couple the standard FK percolation with the FK percolation condition on an increasing event. That's, um, so there is something more. It's not just an induction and in for this. Small q, it's not true. And for some q, it's not true. Just it's, it's wrong. Yeah. OK. So, let me now just tell you that I cheated you, of course. 
because it, it looks <laughs> not, I mean, maybe it doesn't look simple, but it doesn't look so hard. So where did I cheat you? Well, uh, by, by the way, sorry, first thing for those who don't like percolation, this result implies the computation for the critical point of the POTS model, which was also a long-standing conjecture. Okay, that was a parenthesis. Let's go back to there. Where did I cheat you? I, I, I told you, I gave you five seconds to think about it, so I hope you all see where I cheated you. Uh, well, I cheated you here. It is true that when I take percolation, uh, FK percolation, I end up with a dual percolation. But let's think for a moment of what would happen in a finite box. So if I give you a finite box, and so let's call it lambda, then omega star is going to be a Bernoulli percolation, uh, uh, FK percolation on the dual graph, lambda star. But notice that the dual graph actually has a very different structure than the primal one. Why? Because the dual graph here has a very special vertex which is connected here to everybody on the boundary. Okay? So, in fact, this identity is true except that this dual lambda star here doesn't really look like a standard box. It's wired on the boundary. On the boundary, all the vertices are connected to a single vertex. And it happens that this, I mean, it has a kind of different geometry as a standard box. When you are going to take the limit, you actually are going to end up with two different measures. So the limit of, if, if you take a standard box and you take the limit, what I call P, uh, so this was the limit, say, of the P lambda N PQ, well, it's different from the limit, let's call it P1 PQ, that you get by taking this lambda N uh, dot, let's call it like that, where you basically wired all the vertices on the boundary. You just get a different measure. Obviously, for Q equal 1, you don't, because this wiring is not really changing anything. But remember that here, we are counting the connected components. So if on the boundary, I'm telling you all the vertices are connected to a single vertex, the way you are counting clusters is completely different. And it's so different that it may be that this is different than that. Actually, I should say, I mean, it's not necessarily true. OK? So I cheated you here because this is not going to be necessarily true. But if you really just want to prove this theorem, then you have ways you can, for instance, work on tori and use that there. It's basically an exact, integrability, uh, exact self duality. You have ways to go around. But what I wanted to do, and, and I mean, through this, this thing, I wanted to illustrate that when you work with dependent models, you want to encode what is happening outside your graph, outside your... Um... Here, if I just, I mean, if I look at this box and I tell you I just look at this box, and if somebody comes to me and says, but I want to look at this box with all the vertices wired to one guy outside, I'm going to get a completely different model. So that motivates the introduction of boundary conditions. So now, when I'm going to look at a measure, I'm going to add a boundary condi condition on this measure. What would be the, I mean, yeah, a boundary condition, sorry. And it's basically going to change nothing except in the way I'm counting the clusters. In the way I'm counting the clusters, what I'm going to do is that 
I'm going to count the clusters. And I mean, OK, I didn't tell you what a boundary condition is. So a boundary condition is going to be a partition of the edges, a partition of the vertices of the boundary of my box. OK, I just give myself a partition of, uh, of the vertices. And now I count, I count the clusters, but thinking that any points on the boundary which are in the same partition are, of, in fact, together. They are the same. They are identified. OK, so it's counting clusters after identification of vertices in the same uh, element of the partition. OK, so for instance, our original case here was simply when you take the partition made of singletons. Right? I'm not adding any additional wirings. There is another one, another partition that you could think of is a partition with one element, all the guys on the boundary. And in this case, this is what we call the wired boundary condition, this one here. And here, the true statement is that the dual of a measure with what we call free boundary conditions, so a measure like that, is a measure with wired. OK, so here I should also, of course, renormalize in a different way. It's a little bit like, you see, as soon as you have a dependent model, you want, I mean, for, for people who know the easing model, for instance, you are going to introduce boundary conditions on the boundary of your graph to encode the dependencies coming from the boundary, from, from the exterior of your graph. Here, it's exactly the same. We encode, this is something that is going to encode The dependence is coming from outside my graph. So for instance, if I want to understand what is the probability of a certain configuration, knowing that omega e, I mean, a certain configuration inside the box, knowing that omega outside the box is equal to a certain configuration uh, psi. OK? Imagine, you know, I look at my infinite volume measure and I tell you, well, I tell you all the information outside my graph. I tell you this edge, omega e is equal to a psi e, and I give you psi for every edge. Okay? In the case of Bernoulli percolation, that gives me no information on what is inside, absolutely none, because everything is independent. But here, I am actually getting some information because in the way I'm counting clusters, what is happening outside is important. Well, this thing is just going to be a FK percolation. So let's say you want this to be equal to a phi. So it's going to just be the probability of phi in a FK percolation in my box except that I'm going to have some boundary condition, psi of psi, which are exactly what? They are going to be the boundary condition that you are going to say two points are in the same partition function, uh, uh, in the same element of the partition, sorry about that, if they are connected outside in psi. In, 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 in psi sorry. Okay? So for instance, if there there is a pass from there to there, these two guys are in the same element of the partition. So it's a way to encode the dependencies. OK. But you are going to see this, this plays actually an important role. That was a parenthesis for now. Let's go back to Bernoulli percolation. And let me tell you a little bit more about these crossing probabilities. OK. So back to Bernoulli percolation. <laughs> uh, 
And let me tell you about the RSW theory. So earlier, for Bernoulli pair collation, I didn't cheat you. I proved to you that the crossing of basically a square was one half. But imagine I ask you the same question for a rectangle, a n by 2 n box, or a any, in fact, shape. Imagine I give you a shape, omega, and four points on the boundary, a, b, c, d. And I tell you, OK, you have a very fine mesh size uh, square lattice. And I want to know what is the probability of crossing from a, b to c, d. OK? Well, for the box, for the square box, it was simple because the opposite, I mean, the complementary event was the event that there is a dual crossing going from BC to AD. And there, I used that that was the same probability as the original thing. But here, as soon as I have a general omega, it's absolutely different quantities, and it's not so clear that even this thing is not tending to 1 or to 0, depending on the shape. You could think if you take a shape which is like crossing a rectangle which is uh, thinner in the easy direction, then you could think it tends to 1, and in the hard direction to 0. That could be a possibility. Well, it's not the case, and it's a theorem which dates back to 78 by Rousseau on one side and Seymour and Welsh on the other side. And that says, whatever the domain for any omega a, b, c, d, there exists a constant c such that this probability at one half well, remains between c and 1 minus c. So it doesn't tend to 0, it doesn't tend to 1. And you may think, OK, well, in that, that has to be something trivial to prove. Well, I encourage you to try. So what is completely clear is that, for instance, imagine I can prove to you that the probability, let, let me just illustrate maybe the complexity of the theorem by giving you an example which is simple. Assume that the probability at one half of crossing a n by two n box is larger or equal to constant. Okay? Assume that. Can I prove that crossing uh, n by uh, 100 n box is also not tending to zero. OK? OK, something like that. n by uh, 100 n box. How would I do? Well, what I can try to do is I can try to combine crossings using the FKG inequality. If I have a crossing, then I have even more chance to have another crossing, and so on and so on. So I could take a n by 2n box and say, well, this is crossed with probability c. Then I can take a n by 2n box, or a square, and cross it from bottom to top. This is happening with probability 1 half. Then I can take a n by 2n box, and say this is cross with probability c, etc., etc., and the probability of the intersection by the FKG inequality is larger or equal than the product of the probabilities. So, in finite number of steps, I reach 100n, and I have that the crossing is something like larger than maybe c over 2 to the 100, or I mean something of the sort. So, if you have like one rectangle in the hard direction, then it's easy to get all of them. In fact, I didn't even need an n by 2n, right? I mean, I could have put 1 plus rho n that I could still do that. Like 1 plus epsilon n would be sufficient to make this construction. Well, 
try to prove that n times n, I know that n times n doesn't tend to 0. This is this one half thing. Try to prove that then 1 plus epsilon n times n doesn't tend to 0. And you will see that, well, you want to do things like that. You want to combine crossings together. But as soon as they are of shape n times n, these crossings can be tedious. They can really avoid, you see, I mean, you could do, OK, I, I want to cross there, and I want to cross there. And maybe if I put here a box like that, maybe uh, if I cross, I'm lucky enough from top to bottom, I'm going to connect the two. But well, you know, the guy can do like that. And then you can and just try to play. It's going to be, I mean, if you want to entertain your kids, for instance, you know, <laughs> try to connect the things. Um, it's difficult. There is something to do. And in fact, historically, the only way that people managed to handle this thing was to use independence in a very, very strong way. So this was really a proof for q equal 1. So as soon as you deal with percolation, this is beautiful. Like once you have this rousseau seymour wedge, you can prove millions of things. You can prove what we call cri critical exponents. You can prove that there are scaling limits. You can prove scaling relations. That, I mean, basically, every single thing you know on Bernoulli percolation at criticality is based one way or another at some point on the rousseau seymour wedge theory. Exactly like exponential decay was crucial to understand subcritical, rousseau seymour wedge is crucial to understand critical. And until uh, 2011, basically, all the examples of proof of rousseau seymour wedge were for Bernoulli percolation. There were like tons of them. <laughs> so, you know, you, have, you had multiplication of, of this, uh, these proofs, all more elegant than the others. Like they were beautiful arguments. Very ingenious one, but they were all working only for Bernoulli percolation. Uh, at the exception of Voronoi percolation that I mentioned uh, recently, but this is a very independent percolation model. It's so close to Bernoulli percolation that some of the arguments were, uh, were saved there. Let me just make a last remark on this and then tell you what is the connection with that and uh, in general with understanding dependent percolation models. The last thing I want to say on these things, let me maybe just write it here, is that this thing is in between constant and 1 minus constant. In fact, you expect much more. So there is a conjecture due to Cardi, absolutely beautiful conjecture. And it tells you the probability in question of crossing, where it converges, in fact. So you, you fix the shape, and you take just, for instance, a square lattice of mesh size 1 over n. Then it converges, when n tends to infinity, to a certain quantity. And it's, I mean, historically, Cardi wrote this hypergeometric function. It was not so simple to understand, and so on. But let me interpret geometrically this quantity in a very nice way. So the quantity is interpreted as follows. Your domain omega, by the Riemann mapping theorem, you can map it to a triangle equilateral with, uh, with the sides 1, where A is mapped to A prime, B to B prime, and C to C prime. Right? This is exactly what you are allowed to do from Riemann mapping theorem. So D is going to end up somewhere here. There is going to be D prime there. Right? Well, this thing is converging to this distance, to x. Beautiful conjecture, in particular because. By the of the uh, I said it's a triangle of size 1. Yeah, I, I said it. Yeah. yeah, it's here. I have my lawyer ready for you. <laughs> 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 And I promise it will be less entertaining than, uh, well, anyway. Um, OK, so why is it beautiful in particular? Because this is telling you that if you take another topological rectangle, which is actually conformally mapped to this rectangle, wherein they are both conformally mapped to the same configuration here. So it's telling you that these crossing probabilities, 
they are conformally invariant. And we are back to the discussion of the first lecture where we mentioned that you expect this self forwarding walk to be uh, conformally invariant, well, you expect Bernoulli percolation to be conformally invariant, like here. I should say that this conjecture I mean, is beautiful, but there is even more beautiful than that, that there is a theorem by uh, Smirnov, so it's a theorem for a slightly related model. Smirnov, uh, so uh, when you take site percolation on triangular lattice. But it's still a, an open question for the square lattice. And it's a difficult one. OK, let me conclude with the last part of the talk, which is more related to my research, even though if here I was already in the business. So what did, how did I contribute there? So my goal was, you see, I mean, from, again, from the point of view of probability, Bernoulli percolation is maybe the simplest model you want to consider. It's the most natural one. From the point of view of statistical physics and mathematical physics, it's not really the most uh, interesting model. This whole range of FK percolation are interesting, in particular for integer values of Q because of a relation to POTS models. So I wanted to understand what is happening for these dependent percolation models. And in particular, I wanted to understand what is happening here for these crossing probabilities. And so what is happening at PC of Q when I take FK with priority Q? And let's say just for the drawing, but you could take any shape, let's take a, a rectangle. Okay, because I kind of told you that if you have it for a rectangle, then it's kind of easy to get it. How does this probability behave? I told you where there is the first thing is that it may depend quite a lot on the boundary conditions. So let me allow you, uh, let me allow myself to take a slightly bigger box. So this is, say, this is n, this is uh, alpha n, and let's put an epsilon n uh, thing here. And let's assume that there are some boundary conditions on the boundary of this big box. Let's call it Rn bar. OK? How does this quantity depend on n? How does it depend on alpha? How does it depend on the boundary conditions, psi? Does it depend a lot? Is it completely independent, etc., etc.? Well, the answer is actually tricky. And that's what makes it uh, so beautiful, is that the answer depends on Q. And the theorem is saying the, the following. So it's a, it's a body of, theory of, of results. So maybe I'm not going to state all the results. I mean, I'm not going to mention all the authors. But let me say what it tells you. It tells you that when Q is smaller or equal to 4, and again, larger or equal to 1, exactly for the same reason that you need the FKG inequality, these crossing probabilities, they remain, so blah, blah, like, I mean, they, they, okay. these crossing probabilities, they remain bounded away from 0 and 1 uniformly in N, so this will be exactly the equivalent of the rousseau semo wedge. You fix a shape, then it doesn't tend to 0 and 1. But also uniformly in boundary conditions. And that is fundamental because everywhere you use independence when you work with Bernoulli percolation, in FK percolation, you will need to condition and to use boundary conditions. So this uniformity in boundary condition, it's absolutely fundamental to get it. If you don't get it, you are just lost. You cannot proceed at all. And this is the first, that was the first example of a rousseau semo wedge for dependent percolation model. And the technique is sufficiently robust that now people can get it for several uh, dependent percussion model. So it's really everything you could prove using 
Standard Rousseau Seymour wedge for Bernoulli percolation. Now you have ways of proving it for this dependent percolation model. So it completely opened a new world in front of you in some sense, completely unlocked uh, the, the story here. It's very subtle. I mean, there, there is a very nice story about why is this for. It's really. Uh, and the complementary thing is that when Q is larger than 4, strictly, well, this is completely wrong. Completely wrong. The probabilities, if you take here the free boundary condition, you know the partition function, like the limit of the partition function, which are only made of singletons, then the, it decays exponentially fast, even at criticality. So it's completely different from, uh, from the, you get exponential decay uh, even at criticality, so for free. And if you look at wired, so at this thing, when you take the partition to be everybody wired together, then it goes to one exponentially fast. So it's a completely different story. There you have no chance of proving something even remotely close to Bernoulli percolation. The behavior is completely different. And these are witnesses of what we call a continuous phase transition here and a discontinuous phase transition. here, And you can really see it in the encoding of these crossing probabilities. In one case, the crossing probabilities are fairly independent of the boundary conditions, while in the other case, they depend drastically on it. So drastically that in one case, you can make this thing go to zero exponentially fast, and by choosing other boundary conditions, you can make them go exponentially fast to one. Okay? And what is also interesting in this body of work is that it's really three step, I mean, three works in some sense, which are of independent interest. The first one is telling you not that this occurs or this occurs. It's telling you that if, I mean, that an equivalence between a number of, boundary, of, of conditions this one, the continuity of the phase transition for physicists in the room, the divergence of the correlation length, the infinite susceptibility at criticality, a number of conditions that physicists would obviously think are equivalent from the point of view of saying it's a continuous phase transition, but which mathematically are just not necessarily related. So the first step is to prove that all these, if you want, definition of a continuous phase transition are equivalent. And this is the strongest condition, but there are much weaker conditions. And in particular, one of the conditions which is equivalent to this one is simply that this doesn't go exponentially fast to zero. So if you want to prove that this occurs, you just need to prove that you are not in this condition. And then there are two other works. One consists in proving that when you are there, you don't have exponential decay, so necessarily you are in this case. And when you are here, you do have exponential decay, so you are not in this case. So there are three ingredients. One is very general. It's this kind of, I, I like to call it a dichotomy theorem, that either you are in this very strong rousseau semo wedge, or you are with this very fast exponential decay. And this is a very general result that you can prove for a number of dependent percolation models, actually. And then there are two other works, one which is actually using discrete holomorphicity and an observable a little bit well, like what we defined for self-avoiding work on Tuesday, uh, what we call a paraphernalic observable, and the use of discrete holomorphicity to prove that you are necessarily in this case, in this, uh, in this case. And here it's a, uh, we made rigorous this uh, compu beautiful computation of physicists using the better and that's basically, and the transfer matrix formalism. So this, uh, in addition, what I like is that the, the two last works, they are really based on completely different uh, tools. And, uh, well, I think I already overstepped on your uh, weekend, so uh, let me finish here, and thank you very much. Yeah, so, so historically, I mean, I, I can tell you more after <laughs> because I'm not going to do the proof here, but historically the proof of this statement indeed relied on this self-duality, the fact that P star was equal to P 
at self-duality, and that uh, the square lattice, when you take the dual, is also a square lattice. I personally disliked a lot the fact that this was uh, important in the argument because I didn't believe that that was crucial. I wanted to have it for any critical percolation model, even on a non-self-dual thing. So this uh, result that you are mentioning is exactly the proof of this dichotomy without this condition that, well, at the beginning we needed it because we were not smart enough, but uh, now we are smart enough at least to prove that. So that's the difference in some sense between the two. But the new result is just englobing, if you want. It's just better than the, the dichotomy result in this special case. And I can tell you a little bit more about it. Yeah, um, this Cardi conjecture that you yeah. mentioned here, that is indeed very nice, but there's another reason. I think it shows you that there's a hidden triangular symmetry in regular circulation. And my senses that that's somehow related to the difficulty of proving it for the square lattice theorem. Because that's interesting in the beginning. But, but it's sort of I, uh, I'm not sure I would agree with that because uh, the hexagonal lattice, I mean the, the loop ON model on the hexagonal lattice, which is a kind of other way of writing this percolation on triangular lattice, is actually a perfectly fine model to prove conformal invariance indeed of percolation, but also of the easing model, for instance. And the easing model doesn't have this, uh, this right. triangle symmetry. So I don't think that the triangle symmetry, I mean, this, this 2 pi over 3 symmetry of the lattice is so crucial for the proof. Uh, that I, I'm not sure I would, uh, I would agree I, with that. Nobody seems, nobody seems to know how, where the triangle symmetry is coming from. Uh, yeah, well, it, yeah, I mean, it's just, I mean, you always have a triangle symmetry with a different uh, isocell uh, triangle if you take other universality classes. And indeed, percolation end up being uh, uh, this one, but I don't think, uh, well, for instance, maybe to, to tell you that the, the, the rotation is maybe not so crucial, I think, I'm not certain, I mean, uh, with, our, with my PhD students, that we are able to prove rotational symmetry of this uh, quantity. So not conformal symmetry, but rotational symmetry. So you see, I mean, we get this 2 pi over 3 symmetry, and still we, are, uh, uh, we don't know yet how to get to full conformal invariance. So, so that's, uh, that's... Any other? Let me just say, yeah. to be sure I'm understood correctly. So to prove directly by hand somehow that the that the crossing in an n by 2n rectangle, yeah. just using the n by n, this is not simple? This is not simple, yeah. It's not in simple. In the independent case, it is. Well, it, uh, it's, uh, I mean, it's easy. I mean, you can, I think that most of the people in the room would still spend a few days before managing. I mean, it's not, when you see the proof, it's easy. Yeah, when you see the proof, it's easy that I'm not arguing with it, but, uh, but I mean, it's a clever proof. It's not... Uh... Okay. Uh, okay, so let's say uh, thank uh, Google again for the lecture today and for the screen.